Well, thank you uh, very much for having me. Well, Belly of the Beast uh, is a team that's composed of both Cuban and American journalists, uh, and we cover mostly what is Cuba-U.S. relations. You know, our aim, I guess, is to um, to approach the subject from a human point of view, to tell some of the stories, uh, uh, in this case, mostly of the, the Cuban people, and um, to collaborate with each other. I think that the fact of bringing together the culture and the ways of working from, you know, both Cuban and, and American into this specific subject, uh, it has been very interesting uh, so far. And it, I think, has produced a very interesting result, which is more important. Well, um, well, first of all, um, to, to talk about Cuba-U.S. relations, which is the basis uh, of our work, you have to understand that since the Cuban Revolution happened back in 1959, right from the beginning, uh, the U.S. government has imposed uh, an embargo, pretty much an economic blockade uh, on Cuba that has lasted all the way um, till, till today. Now, this have, has had uh, different approaches throughout time. Some presidencies have been tougher on Cuba than, than others. And the Trump administration was uh, was particularly harsh on this on this subject. Back in 2014, uh, Barack Obama tried a different approach, a, an approach of engagement uh, between the, the two countries. And uh, everyone here, I think, was very hopeful with what com could come up uh, of that. But sadly, uh, right after uh, Trump came into power, this new approach was dismantled. And what was left instead was um, more than 200 sanctions, new sanctions uh, against Cuba. So I guess the war in Cuba wanted to approach this 60-year-old policy and put it in the context of the Trump administration, which was even worse uh, than before. We wanted to do it from a very human point of view. I think many times this issue is addressed, um, and I guess it focuses too much on the technicalities of it or in the figures. Uh, and the numbers. Uh, but what we wanted to do was to start off with the actual people, the Cuban people that suffer uh, the consequences, maybe more directly or indirectly, but to focus on them. Because it is, it, it does replicate all over um, our society. So that was the basis of our work. It has, uh, it has three parts. The Warren Cuba is a documentary series. It has uh, three parts and it focuses on specific issues uh, within that uh, policy, pretty much. Cuba became a republic back in 1902, right? But right from the beginning uh, of, of Cuba as, as an independent country, as a republic, there has been a lot of American influence. What I mean is that our economy was mostly based on trade with, with uh, American companies, American businesses. We had two different military interventions throughout that time. Now, um, the thing is, when Cuban Revolution happens in 1959, we're talking about a, a process that brought together a lot of Cuban society and different elements that eventually gathered behind the figure of Fidel Castro and, and changed the country. Those economic relations and that dependence that Cuba had from the United States uh, was broken. And that is something that pretty much brought, uh, that has marked all the relations after that, which is a confrontational relation. Of course, the fact that we are a socialist country and that for a long time we're aligned uh, with the Soviet Union and the other socialist countries within the world uh, and in the context of the Cold War has also uh, marked that relation. So what we're talking about specific when I say blockade, embargo, sanctions, we're talking about pretty much the United States uh, prevents Cuba not only from doing business with American companies and American individuals, but also apply sanctions on other countries and other companies from, from other nations that try to do the same. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're talking also, um, in, in, in different moments in time, we're talking about, I don't know, lately we had a, an, an oil blockade, like no oil was allowed into Cuba from Venezuela, which is our main source of that. So these individual sanctions have been happening for a long time. Now. Uh, for people who just jump into this matter, 
during the Trump administration, uh, they could be led to believe that Trump was doing something very different from his predecessors. And even though Barack Obama did try something different, uh, his behavior towards Cuba has been consistent uh, with everything that's happened from Eisenhower Kennedy uh, till um, until nowadays. That's that's basically uh, the, the basis of, of this matter. Right now, for example, um, the pandemic has hit us hard, right? As it, as it has had happened in most countries. But in our specific case, uh, we depend a lot on tourism, for instance. And since tourism is out of the picture, the economy is struggling right now. If you, if you add to that the, the sanctions, what this has caused right now is scarcities. We have long lines to access food. There's very little um, products of all, uh, of all kinds coming into the country right now. And this, we must understand, is directly linked to the sanctions. Why? Sometimes it's more direct. For instance, in the case of the oil that I mentioned before, you can see it right there because the U.S. stops the ships from coming into Cuba so that we have no oil. But in some other cases, it has more to do with the government's ability to have more money to, to buy all the things that we need. So, for instance, if you go to the, to the, the medical sector, Sometimes uh, Cuba has to buy medicines that it needs or, or the products to make medicine uh, from third countries. So perhaps a product that would be easier for, for us to access in the American market, we cannot do that. And we have to pay some other country to get it for us and that is more expensive. And that happens in pretty much every sector of, of our economy. Now the way I as a Cuban citizen feel it is that um, you know, when you try to get something and it's not there, more than likely you can link it somehow in a, a bigger or a smaller scale to those, uh, to those sanctions. I mean, this is the, the big question right now. You know, I mean, of course, um, I think most Cubans and, and most people who who feel for this issue uh, uh, are hopeful that uh, Joe Biden uh, tries something different, doesn't go with, the, with, with what Trump has done before him. Uh, Joe Biden was the vice president of Barack Obama when the uh, engagement policy was applied. And there are different groups uh, advocating for that path to be retaken. However, there are, there's also other groups that are advocating for the opposite, bit, which is the tough on Cuba approach. Uh, they're led particularly uh, in, in terms of politicians by uh, Cuban American politicians in the United States, such as Marco Rubio uh, or Bob Menendez, and also by a very significant group of people, particularly in, in the state of Florida. So the Biden administration has given out very little into what could be their approach on Cuba. So anything, any assessment that I can make right now is based on, on very few elements. Of course, I think the huge majority of us are hopeful that the Obama approach can be retaken. But honestly, uh, right now, it's really hard to read the political landscape. And honestly, I don't think, uh, I think most people agree that Cuba is not a priority for the Biden administration uh, for now. So we'll just have to wait and hope for the best. Well, Raul Castro just stepped down from, from, from as head of Cuba's Communist Party. But we have had the person that took over from him, Miguel Diaz-Canel, has been our president since 2018. So I guess that for us here in Cuba, it's not, it doesn't come as such a big shock because we have been seeing this other person uh, leading the country for some time now. I, I think uh, Cuba is a changing society, right? But I don't, I don't know how much of that can be attributed 
to the fact that we have a different person uh, as a head of country because most of these changes um, he has picked up from his predecessor, in this case, Raul Castro. I'm talking specifically back in 2011, uh, Cuba started opening its economy more. Private businesses were allowed after a long time. Foreign investments started coming in more. Tourism started to blossom. And uh, also the entrance of the internet within Cuban society has met big changes in, in everything, but particularly, of course, in the way we communicate and the way we try to create common consensus. But these are not seen things that could be directly linked to this new leadership. And of course, Miguel Diaz-Canel belongs to the same party, to the same ideology. However, I do think that there's a lot of importance in the symbolic value of this, because this means the completion of a generational shift within the leadership of the country. Uh, Diaz-Canel is someone that was born after the revolution. He's, uh, and I think a part of the, of the Cuban people, uh, especially older generations, still feel somehow obligated to the generation that uh, did the Cuban revolution back in the 50s. And that is no longer a part of the equation. So it's easier for Cubans as a whole to demand more uh, from, from, from this government, because, precisely because it belongs to a different generation. And also, I think, you know, uh, Cuba as a whole, but particularly Cuban government, needs more youth, needs that generational shift in order to move forward uh, to, a better, uh, to a better place. So I think perhaps this symbolic change might not be so immediate or so material, but I think it might end up being more important than any actual change happening in this moment. Look, we have many issues going on in Cuba right now. I think I would have to say the main ones are economic because we need to find a way to make our system affordable, you know, and to improve uh, people's lives. We also have other issues. I think we are trying to figure out who we are as a country and how we address specific concerns of, of the people, particularly of younger generations. Now, I think Cuba's problems or obstacles to, to, to move forward could be categorized into two big groups, the internal ones and the external ones. When I mention the internal obstacles, I think the mostly focus on our government's capability to adapt to new times and, and, and to a different reality. Uh, we have, for instance, we have a lot of bureaucratism in, 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 in our society. Uh, and, and sometimes the changes that we hope for are either not implemented or not implemented quickly enough. Like we got new constitution back in 2019. And however, the legal implementation of this constitution has moved very slowly. And I think that is something that you can identify many in, in, in many sectors of, of, of our society. Also, um, our executive power holds too much of the power, and sorry for being redundant, uh, within the way that, that Cuba works. And it is many times hard to, to get to a consensus that actually respects the public opinion and, and that respects different voices. And that, that is undeniable. So obviously we have internal issues that have to do with the way our government works uh, that are a part of the equation. It would be, it would be a lie to say otherwise. Um, but of course, at the same time, you have the most powerful country in the world, you know, in, in harassing you with, with constant sanctions. So I think many people that try that, that let's say, are more permissive with the mistakes of the Cuban government will always will always say, hey, but we haven't seen how this would work without the sanctions, or without the embargo being, being a part of the equation, right? And I think there is a point to that assessment. You know, it might not be necessarily fair, or it, it might work on a black and white kind of analysis, which they're, you know, uh, as usual, not complete, but there is a point to that, to that assessment. So I guess we have both, you know, it's, um, I guess I'm being Solomonic in my response, but we do have both both issues, and uh, it is really complicated to to address them both. Also, when it comes to a communicational level, I think some people try to go to, to the extremes, and what I mean is that 
Cuba's problems are, for some people, either entirely the fault of the U.S. blockade or entirely the fault of socialism and our government's mistakes. And I think the reality is somewhere in between, you know. And, and, and I think the key to move to a better place from here is to, to, to get to that center place and try to deal with both these problems uh, the best we can. So when I mean we're changing society, I think um, I, I would link it mostly to, to the fact that we are at this point very far away from what was the initial Cuban revolution and that generation of people that built it that wasn't just, uh, you know, the people in power. You know, the Cuban revolution was a popular movement, you know, that had the support of the majority of the country. But that generation is so far away. We're talking about, I don't know, my generation's grandparents or great great grandparents. And these, my generation, I guess, younger generations are less focused on the ideology of the Cuban social project and more focused on its actual capability of working and being sustainable and working for most people. And there are different, different expressions um, of that. Uh, when it comes specifically to, I don't know, artists or, or maybe journalists calling for, for more uh, freedom, I think um, uh, some of them do, do, ha do have a point. You know, it is, um, it is complicated in Cuba to, in my case, be a journalist and in some other cases um, be an artist. But I think, um, I think most mainstream media tends to exaggerate the scale of, of this group of artists or this group of people. I think if you were to ask to most average Cubans, they would not be actually worried about, you know, uh, I don't know, their demands because maybe they don't even know who they are. Or on the other hand, you know, they're more concerned with more material things like, you know, getting, getting the stuff that you need to eat because it is a complicated time at this moment. So in terms of what could change with this new leadership in relation to this artist, I think it's, I think it's, it's hard to read. I think to, to really answer that question, we need to get out of the pandemic. Because um, I think once the economy stabilizes, it would be easier to actually see how much actual effect have these people had within Cuban society or not.